This is Tuned Into the Land, the California Rangeland Trust podcast. Here, we will dig into a variety of topics with the partners, conservationists, and ranchers who demonstrate every day, through their words and actions, the importance of conserving California's working lands. Tune in each month to learn more about our mission and how you can get involved in preserving the future of the Golden State for generations to come. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Tune In to the Land. I am your host, Michael Delbar, California Rangeland Trust CEO. And as you heard in our last episode of this podcast, conservation easements are what we do here at the Rangeland Trust, or part of what we do. So we thought today we would take you through what a conservation easement is and is not, and what it means to put an easement on a piece of property. So in order to do that, who better to discuss this than our conservation director, Jackie Flat? Jackie has been a part of the Rangeland Trust now for over a year, and she oversees all of our conservation unit team, which starts with the application process all the way through the annual monitoring. So with that, we're excited to have Jackie here today to give us a rundown on conservation easements. Before we get to that excitement, Jackie, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you for having me today. Um, I am a Northern California native, born and raised here um, in the Sacramento area. I went to school at UC Davis and then afterwards attended the University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law. Um, I spent about six and a half years doing telecom work. Um, leases, negotiations, contract, um, and as glamorous as that sounds, after about six and a half years, I was ready for a change. So what drew you to us? Well, I am a, an Elk Grove native, um, a third generation Elk Grove native, actually, and I have seen Elk Grove evolve from a small town um, to a bustling city, and open spaces that were literally across the street from my parents' house are now filled with residential development, auto malls, there's a casino coming in. While I understand development is important, it needs to be done in a responsible way. And CRT's mission to preserve working landscapes and open spaces really spoke to me. Well, we are very grateful to have you part of the Rangeland Trust team. So why don't we start off by defining what is a conservation easement? A conservation easement is a voluntary legal agreement between a property owner and CRT. Um, the landowner agrees to extinguish development rights on their property forever. Um, that can be accomplished by us purchasing those development rights or by them donating the value of those development rights. So it's really a contract. It is a contract. And then I think that's a, a good clarification because I actually had to explain to a county assessor once, believe it or not, that a conservation easement was different than a road easement. So a conservation easement is a, a conservation contract that is perpetual, right? That's correct. It is forever. So there are a couple different types of conservation easements that we work with. One of those is becoming increasingly popular and that's the mitigation easement. Can you explain what is a mitigation conservation easement? Of course. A mitigation conservation easement occurs when a developer is looking to build something on the land, uh, whether it be a shopping mall, a residential development, whatever it may be, and it has negative impacts to habitat, um, whether it's plants or animal species. Um, sometimes they are required to mitigate for those impacts by finding another area that has that specific habitat and then putting a conservation easement on it. Most of that's on rangeland. A lot of it is on rangeland, yes. Um, it is part of the um, organization that we're seeing more and more activity in is the mitigation area. So one of the more recent mitigation easement projects in which we, we completed is the Creekview Northern project in Roseville, not too far from Sacramento. What makes that project unique? Well, that project is unique in that the conserved property is actually in the middle of this residential development. This particular developer partner um, had reserved a portion of the property that they were developing, and it's surrounded by residences. It's a, approximately an 84-acre portion that was set aside for grazing. 
and it's offsetting the impacts to the habitat that they're disturbing by building that residential development. Um, typically, we would see mitigation easements on ranches that are a little bit more remote, not necessarily accessible to the public. But this particular project, the neighborhood can actually go on hiking trails or biking trails throughout and see the grazing that's happening and see the preserve for their own eyes. That's pretty cool. And the grazing is required as habitat management. That's correct. Cows and the critters and the people have homes. Kumbaya. So some of the other types of mitigation projects we've done have been for renewable energies like solar, wind, road projects with Caltrans. Uh, is, is the economy picked up after it was slowed for so long? We're starting to see more and more of those mitigation easements and Rangeland Trust has really done a lot of those and become a leader in California on, on providing the easements and the management of the easement monitoring for those types of projects. That's true. Mitigation easements are not just for developers um, in the residential arena. Um, like you mentioned, Caltrans uh, has to perform mitigation for impacts related to highway realignments or new roads and right of ways going in. Um, PG&E and other um, utility providers have to perform mitigation for impacts based on solar farms or wind farms. So we're seeing a lot of that um, coming through. So besides the mitigation easements, we do other types of easements. Can you go into a little bit about how those are done? Sure. So under the traditional conservation easement umbrella, meaning not mitigation, there are three ways to accomplish conservation. Um, the quickest and easiest way to accomplish that is just by a donated easement, where a landowner will donate the value of those development rights without expecting a purchase of those development rights. So they just jump straight into the transaction phase. We start getting the title work done, all of the documents queued up, and we can probably close that easement within about a year. And there's not to say that because we aren't purchasing the development rights, there aren't monetary benefits because there are tax benefits to a donated easement. Like the federal enhanced conservation tax incentive. Yes, which you can carry forward longer than a traditional donation. 15 years, mm -hmm. plus the year of donation. And that could be either 50% or 100% of the donated value, depending on whether or not the, the rest of the income is derived from agriculture. That's correct. So one of our more recent donated easements is the Sagehorn Russell Ranch outside of Woolitz in Mendocino County. And that one's kind of near and dear to my heart because it's close to home. And Jerry and Marilyn Russell, the landowners, were so passionate about protecting that ranch and were able to, to do that recently. They have no heirs, so the ranch is going to their longtime ranch manager and, and their his family. So it's really touches a person to see something like that happen uh, for, for them and for the next generations. Yeah, for those who are financially able and who have the philosophy to conserve, you know, we can get it done quickly for them, and we're happy and proud to do so. So for a lot of landowners, a lot of their value is in the development rights. So we could purchase those development rights in a traditional conservation easement, right? Yes, and a purchase easement is the most common way that we pursue a conservation easement with our landowners. Um, typically, we will look to public funding sources, um, state, federal, um, and then other times we look to private funding sources as well to raise the money to make the purchase of those development rights. I think a great example of that is our Bufford Ranch project down in Kern County. So tell me more about that one because we just did some public and private fundraising for that one, right? That's correct. Um, so Ernest Bufford is the landowner. He is a retired U.S. Marshal turned rancher. Um, he purchased some property down in Kern County and decided to put an easement on it. We funded the first purchase via public funds uh, through state funders. Then he turned around, purchased more property. We went to state sources for that and were able to conserve a second portion. And now we're on the third portion and we're able to fundraise internally for that and then also uh, look to public funding to close the gap. Um, and it looks like he's just going to continue the cycle of buying more property and putting more under easement. So his story is really cool. He 
didn't start off as a rancher. He was in law enforcement. Like you mentioned, he was a U.S. Marshal and he loved to hunt and he would hunt on some friend's property. And one time the, the friend said, Ernest, why don't you just go get your own property? And by the way, here's this ranch for sale up in Kern County because he's from L.A. And he went up and visited, fell in love with it and bought it. And now he's putting the pieces back together. And so it's a really a, a cool story. And he's an, he's an awesome gentleman to, to visit with. We're proud to have him as one of our landowner partners. Yes, we are. It's been really fun to work with him. So once we go through the easement process and it's done, it's recorded, what's next? Uh, well, once the conservation easement has closed, um, we move into the stewardship phase. And we will come out and do a visit once a year. Um, it's pretty low key, depending on the size of the property it can take anywhere between a half an hour to a couple hours. Um, we just go to specific points on the property, make sure that nothing nothing has changed since the time the conservation easement has been placed on it. Uh, make sure you're not building an amusement park or an apartment complex or anything like that since the development rights have been extinguished. And then we're done and we visit you the next year. So it's pretty painless. Very painless. So when the monitoring team, when they go out, they get to know those landowners pretty well, don't they? Yes, um, typically they will have had conversations with them beforehand if they do any site visits, if they um, go out and assist with the baseline report, which is a component of the conservation easement. Um, so they've already established a relationship usually and they you know, are our best uh, resource with um, talking to the landowners, um, seeing if anything's changed, if they're seeing any challenges um, they're really our, our best source of communication with the landowner after the, the easement is closed. So folks can actually see an example of our monitoring by our Monitoring Monday videos that we've been doing this last year. Mikey McDonald, who is our rangeland stewardship specialist, has put together these videos and they're really cool. They talk about what it's like to monitor, what we look for, and it's a, they're not very long, they're very short, and they're available for anyone to kind of see a little bit behind the scenes of our stewardship monitoring. Yeah, and you can find those on Instagram too. Great. In going out and doing those monitorings, we also learn a lot about not only the landowner, but the ranch itself. And one of the interesting stories we learned recently was on the Sardella Ranch up in Tuolumne County, where our monitors and team found out that Mike Sardella, the landowner, was doing a lot of fire prevention work with CAL FIRE and some of the practices that they've put in place. And it's those little things like that that we share then with other landowners about the opportunities to do some of these practices on their properties as well. Yeah, um, it can be a really good resource for landowners to learn about um, not just opportunities with CAL FIRE, but NRCS, WCB, um, a lot of other state agencies that have programs for restoration or habitat enhancement that kind of thing. So what are some of the reasons a landowner pursue a conservation easement? Well, there are many reasons to pursue a conservation easement. Philosophy aside, sometimes there is a financial need by a landowner. Um, ranching is an expensive business. There have been lots of developments that add costs through regulation. Uh, sometimes the property owner is in need of an infusion of cash to pay off uh, expensive estate taxes. Um, if the property has been in the same family for a long time and part of the family wants out and wants to divest, it can be used to pay for their portion so that ownership can remain the same. We had an example, several examples of that. One is the Flinge Ranch where family members wanted out and cousins wanted to keep ranching as they've been doing and they were able to take the proceeds from the easement to buy out the relatives so they can remain on the land. So I think that's a pretty, pretty common factors as to why folks would look at a conservation easement. How can taxes play a role in this decision making? As I alluded to before, it can help a rancher um, keep their property and avoid having to sell off pieces of land in order to pay estate taxes or property taxes or maybe any other financial burden. You know, the estate tax, or as we call it, the death tax, was a big factor several years ago. It's, Lately, it hasn't been as a large a factor, but it could change and go back to uh, a strong impetus for folks to pursue an easement. 
We have a number of examples where the death tax would have resulted in the loss of the ranch, or the breaking up of the property if it weren't for the conservation easement that was placed. The Marshall Ranch in Humboldt County is a good example of that. Uh, one little piece had to be sold off, but the rest of the ranch was able to be saved by the sale of the conservation easement. Another example is the Copeman Ranch in Sonola in Alameda County. That ranch was going to be lost due to an estate tax burden, but Tim Copeman, the landowner, was able to sell a conservation easement. Actually, we've done three different easements on that ranch, but the proceeds from that first sale allowed him to keep the ranch in the family as it had been for generations. So it is an important tool in that regard. Yeah, the Koopman family is just one of numerous dedicated ranching families that these easements have helped keep in ranching and keep in the family. You know, we talk about the, the tax benefits, the financial benefits of doing a conservation easement on a working ranch, but, you know, there's always the emotional benefit. And we have two landowner partners that we lost in December. Uh, both projects were really touching and emotional to get done. But when I talked to the, to the wives of the two landowners that both passed away in December, and I heard the passion in their voices and the relief that they knew that the ranch was going to stay as it was and was done before their husbands passed away was so touching. And it really reaffirms the work that we do in protecting these lands, not only for the, for the livestock and the critters and the benefit of the, all Californians, but for those families and their pieces of mind. Monetary benefit aside, I think that is the main driving factor for many of our landowner partners, knowing that a piece of their legacy is going to be preserved through preserving the land. So we know that easements are good for the landowner, but what about the land itself? What are the benefits environmentally of doing an easement? Well, there are many environmental benefits, as you know. Um, you are preserving the land and its state um, forever. We actually recently contracted with some scientists from UC Berkeley to investigate the monetary benefits of preserving rangeland. At the time, we had about 306,000 acres of rangeland conserved, and they found that it provides $1.44 billion in environmental benefits every single year, um, not just to the landowners, but to the state of California and its population as a whole. Um, and in general, conservation easements offer a return of investment of $3.47 for every dollar invested at the time the easement is placed. I would love to get $3.50 back for every dollar I ever invested. It hasn't happened, but I, that would sure be nice. So that was the ecosystem services study. So what are ecosystem services? How do you define that term? Ecosystem services are goods and services that we get from nature, um, such as food and fiber production, clean air and water, climate regulation, and scenic view sheds. In fact, 85% of water runs over or through rangelands. So by protecting rangelands, we are protecting our water resources, we are protecting biodiversity, we're helping to regulate the climate and improve biological control, and there are numerous view shed and recreational benefits as well. So a conservation easement actually benefits not only the landowner and the environment and the critters on those properties, but also all Californians. All Californians, yes. A good example of a project that encapsulates a lot of these values and benefits is a 10,000 acre ranch that we are actively working on protecting. Um, it's near the Pinnacles National Park. On this particular ranch, there are water resources, there are numerous species like bobcats, quail, potentially tiger salamander, and they have documented at one point 15 California condor in one sighting, which I believe is about 10% of the entire California condor population. Wow. It's pretty significant. So we've talked about the benefits of an easement, but easements have received a bad rap at times. Can you tell us what an easement is not. What are some of the misconceptions that are out there? Well, 
I think that a lot of landowners are concerned about potential government involvement and government overreach. Um, conservation easements are something that are um, supported by our governments. And a lot of the time we look to government sources for funding. So they do have somewhat of an interest in the easement. However, once the easement closes, they have very, very little to do with the stewardship of the property. They're mostly involved just to ensure that the terms of the grant are being upheld through the terms of the conservation easement deed. And other than that, they might want to accompany us on our site visit, maybe once every three years, maybe never. That's our role, right? The monitoring is our role, that's what we do. And we provide a report, they're not the ones out doing that. That's correct. They like to get out of the office too sometimes. So one of the concerns of conservation easements is making it difficult to continue to farm or ranch in the future. How do we address that in the easement process? Well, one of our main goals in our conservation easements are to allow property owners to keep working the land as they have been. Um, obviously, what they're doing is working, so we want to make sure that they can keep doing it. To that end, we try to keep the easement terms as flexible as possible so that the landowners can continue their work. So if they wanted to do something in the future, such as build a house or plant a crop or change from cattle to sheep or some other agricultural enterprise, is that allowed? Or is it locked down today, everything they can do in the future? We do have some flexibility within the conservation easement um, in terms of what the property owner can do. And if you're talking about intensified ag, we do allow up to 10% of the easement area to be converted. Um, so if it's a thousand acre easement, they can convert up to a hundred acres into intensified ag and change up that land use a little bit. If they know that they want to build a house somewhere on the property, we can reserve one, two, maybe even three spots, just depending on how large the property is. It's all negotiated. Yeah, it's all negotiated. One of the concerns landowners have is that they will be told how to manage their land, how to run their operations. Oftentimes that could be done through a management plan. What's our approach to management plans on these easements? Well, luckily, a management plan only comes into play if it's required by a grant funder. And we're seeing less and less of those requirements lately, which is a positive thing. Um, if one is required, we work with both the landowner and the grant funder to make sure that they're as least restrictive as possible, that there's a lot of flexibility within them, and it is not recorded alongside the easement. It is referenced in the easement so that changes can easily be made without needing to go through an amendment process, which can be cost prohibitive and take a long time. And some old easements actually had those management requirements in the easement language, which has definitely made them difficult to work with, but also, since they're perpetual, difficult to change. So by incorporating a management plan as a living document, then as environment changes, circumstances change, practices change, those can be amended so that they are really a living document. Yes, and it's much less burdensome on all parties involved. We've seen, particularly in the past, land trusts that are not agricultural oriented. And those easements and management plans may not be conducive to continuing a, a successful operation, an economically viable one. That's why it's important for landowners to partner with an organization like the California Range Land Trust that's mission is to protect those ranching resources. The grazing is a conservation value that we prioritize, don't we? Yes, it's so important to us, in fact, that it's on the first page of our easement and it's a requirement that grazing is a tool that is used throughout the life of the easement, which is forever, as a way to protect the resources. So California Rangeland Trust, in our 23 years of existence, has become so successful that we are the largest California land trust with over 365,000 acres permanently protected. 
What do you think we can attribute that success to? Well, the Rangeland Trust was started by ranchers for ranchers. It's a requirement to be on our board that you are part of the community, whether you uh, operate a ranch, come from a ranching family. Um, but again, you must be part of the ranching community. I think that goes a long way when landowners are considering what land trust they might want to go to because they recognize that by being in the community, we understand what challenges they might be facing. Well, it's key too because that's, you said that's what builds that trust with the landowners, but being able to make decisions as a land trust, if something should come up in the future on a, on a ranch, on an easement, being able to understand why, what happened there, what were the the factors involved, what's it take? You know, I know from my personal experience with our family and, and our board members in the same boat, we know what the impacts of wildfire are or drought or economic conditions. And so all those impact the way a ranch is managed. So having that, having an organization that understands that is really critical. Uh, too often we've seen other land trusts, and there's a lot of land trusts in the state of California, but not many of them are agricultural land trusts. So partnering with one that really puts agriculture first and foremost is so critical. I've, I've been with land trusts that will put a map up on a wall and draw a circle around it and say, we want all this land in the middle. And if you want to make a landowner mad, put their property in the middle of the circle on a map. That is the death knell right there. But that's the mentality a lot of folks have. We're not that way. One of the, I think the key parts to our success has been emphasis on the word voluntary. We don't approach landowners, do we? We do not approach landowners. Um, it is all word of mouth. Um, people understanding what we do because their neighbors have easements on their property because they're friends or acquaintances with our board members that can tell them what we do. Um, it is totally voluntary. We want people to come to us with that conservation philosophy in mind so we can then fill in the pieces. And we've talked about it not being a tool for everybody. And I think that's important that landowners really have that discussion with their families. It's important to sit down, talk to the kids, talk to everybody involved about the pros and the cons of doing an easement project and invoking the doctrine of no surprises. So everybody is on the same page, understands what's happening and moving forward. And I think that's the process itself is one that we take an active role in. How do we help encourage that? Well, when somebody does contact us and has questions about easements, we are completely an open book. We are willing to have as many conversations as it takes um, for a landowner to feel comfortable moving forward. And if ultimately it's not a right fit for them, we're not offended. It's not a right fit for everybody. Um, we encourage questions. If people don't have questions, I do get concerned <laughs> uh, because we don't want any surprises later on in the process for either us or for the landowner. Um, we also encourage consulting with outside experts when it comes to taxes or estate planning. We're not experts in those areas and we want the landowners to feel totally comfortable with how the easement is going to impact all aspects of the transaction. And even though you're an attorney and you're representing us and working on behalf of the, our landowner applicants, we also encourage our landowners to have their own counsel to help them through the process as well, don't we? We do, um, because obviously we do want to look out for our landowners' interests. Um, it is important for them to have somebody who's specifically just dedicated to them. We must be doing something right because we have easements on ranches where the landowner has come back to us time and time again. We talked about Ernest Bufford in, in Kern County. The Creasel Ranch in San Luis Obispo County is another example where Sally Friend, the landowner, has been putting together pieces of the original ranch, buying them and then donating the easements, adding on to the original easement, making it even larger in an overall conserved ranch. We also have the Van Vleck Ranch here in Sacramento County 
where we've done a number of easements on that property as well. So I think that says a lot about the organization and of course the, the conservation staff and all the staff here about why a landowner continues to come back to do more projects with us. Yeah, um, just to mention the Van Vleck projects again, that started off as mitigation easements and the landowner has been so pleased with us. I like to think that he's come back for traditional easements on his property as well. Now that we've gone through the basics of what a conservation easement is, some of what it isn't, how does one start the process with, with the Rangeland Trust? Well, to learn more in general, they can visit our website at rangelandtrust.org or give us a call at 916-444-2096. They can chat or email with me. Um, and if they are interested in moving forward, they can fill out an application. The application can be found on our website as well. Once an application is submitted, then we'll continue to have additional conversations with the property owner, uh, conduct a site visit, present and discuss a budget. And then once the project is formally accepted by our conservation committee, we move forward into either the transaction phase, if it's a donated easement, or into the funding phase, where we're looking for those funds to be able to purchase that easement value. If it is a purchase easement, how important is patience? Very important. <laughs> um, there is a lot of grant funding and a lot of opportunities out there, but they have specific requirements such as species, habitats, different priorities that they're looking to fund. Um, these priorities come and go with the different funders. So sometimes a project will just be in an area that's tough to fund, doesn't have a lot of species that the funders are interested in, and then maybe a couple of years later, a program will come along that's a perfect fit. So patience is very important. So Jackie, thank you for spending the time today to help us all understand how a conservation easement works, what it is, what it isn't, and the importance of picking the right land trust. Thanks for having me. And if anybody wants to chat again with Jackie, give us a call and she'll be glad to visit with you about your project. Jackie mentioned our ecosystem services study that we commissioned with UC Berkeley. Dr. Lynn Hunsinger was the head of that project. Dr. Hunsinger will be our next guest on our podcast. So hit that follow button to be notified when that next episode is ready and share it with your friends. Thank you all for listening. And again, tune in next time to Tuned In to the Land. <music>